I'd just like to do a brief introduction to Rob. So Rob Bishop is a member of our events team. He is our lead electrician, runs his own business. No, no, no surprises, it's an electrical business. Um, and he's been helping the events by doing soldering demonstrations at all of our shows. A lot of people come into O Gage through the ready to run route or because they think oh, it would be wonderful to build my own model. And they sometimes think that soldering is a bit of a dark art. It's not, lots of people can do it. It's not a problem. I learned how to solder both um, a normal soldering iron and a resistance soldering unit. So if I can do it, anybody can do it is what I'd say. So a lot of people come in and if they're new to O-Gage, they might have brought ready to run, but then they think, oh, I'd quite like to do a kit. How do I do that? So tonight we've been concentrating on metal, brass and nickel silver. There is a question about white metal as well, which we'll cover. And obviously, as I said, we'll open up for questions in due course so that you can ask any specific ones that you have. Um, Rob's also produced quite a lot of videos for us, and I hope that most of you have watched the one which was recommended prior to this evening, um, which is a nice introductory video. So I'm going to put Rob onto Spotlight. Yep, you have, have appeared for everybody now. Um, that's, uh, and... that's quite frightening, actually. Yeah, go on. <laughs> <laughs> and just to say, first of all, welcome, Rob. Oh, thank you, Jackie. Um, we're really grateful for you joining us this evening. And we've had quite a lot of questions come through in advance. Um, so I'm going to start with those, if I may. Um, and it may not be a surprise to anybody in the room that quite a few people have asked about the technique that is best used for cleaning the tip of a soldering iron and making sure that the solder actually stays in place when you try to pick it up. I'm sure we've all experienced the, uh, the dripping solder that keeps running off and not staying where you want it to be. So can I hand over to you for that one first? Yeah, uh, tip cleaning. Um, now, I always tend to try and just clean the tip quite simply on a, a damp sponge that I've got here. And the tip should remain nice and bright. I hope we can see that. I hope you can see that. The tip should be nice and bright. So anytime you put any solder on it, it will just flow onto the tip like so and, and stay on there. It's, it's not going to fall off. Um, if your tip doesn't clean with a damp sponge, and I'm also going to say, when I say damp sponge, it doesn't need to be soaking wet. If it's soaking wet, you can actually shock the iron because it, it'll cool it down too quickly so it just doesn't need to be damp um the other thing that i tend to use if the tip does get a little bit cruddy is this um they're, they're basically brass turnings and this is fantastic stuff for taking off any oxidization you get on the tip and again that will bring it back to a to a nice bright tip the other thing that I use, and I'm sure several of you have seen this, this is tip cleaner. It's quite expensive, but I've had this one certainly as long as I've been demonstrating for the Guild. Um, that will give you a really nice bright tip once you've cleaned it with the, with the brass and allow you to sort of carry on soldering. One other thing you can do is just use some rosin cord solder like this one and apply that to it. That will help to keep the tip clean as well. And then just knock off any excess and just keep the tip nice and shiny like so. If the tip keeps oxidizing up and you've got um, one of the irons where you can, or a temperature controlled iron where you can adjust your temperature. And if it keeps oxidizing up, because with sort of this power flow flux is the thing we tend to use and the, the phosphoric acids, it does tend to attack the tips, cause them to oxidize. You can cook the tip too much. It can be too hot. So it may be worth just backing off your temperature slightly. I hope that sort of covered that one. That's very useful. Thank you. There was a specific question from Mr. Derek Shaw. Yep. He's saying that he has to keep tinning 
every time on a copper tip to enable the iron. Yeah, I'm actually wondering, I'm not too sure whether he's actually talking about a traditional copper tip or the sort of modern tips, if we can go back to the overhead again. Um, these tips are basically iron coated copper. Um, if you've got the more traditional, just copper tip in an older style iron, um, it may be it needs tinning with some, I don't know what he's tinning it with. Is he tinning it with solder or is he tinning it with tip cleaners or just with 145 solder? If um, Mr. Shaw in the room, can you hear me? And if so, do you want to unmute and ask your question personally? Mr. Derek Shaw. A stunned silence. No, no response at the moment. Hello, can you hear me now? Oh, yes, lovely, thank you. Okay, I've never learned how to use it. No, well, what it is, I'm using an ordinary tinning compound. So you like, like the rosary tin, this one. But it's actually a uh, tipsy uh, copper tip. It's the uh, same sort of silver colour. Right. I'm using a lot of it and it's expensive and I'm wondering, some people say they, they don't use a lot of it. Right. I've, so I've never used wrong. a great deal of it, but it is, is your soldering iron tip one of the iron coated tips or is it just a pure copper tip? No, it's a copper tip. It's a weller. Right. Um, I, it isn't an iron coated one. It is actually an older style weller or, or what? Oh, no, it's relatively modern, but I mean, I don't know whether it is iron coated or not. Right. When you when you buy the tips, are they silver or are they copper coloured? Copper coloured. Hmm. I've, I've just bought some new tips for it, and they right. they got they got silver to start with, so maybe that's what I should use. I'm trying this higher performance one now, which is eighty watts rather than forty watts. Right. You haven't Apparently, filed the tips at all, have you? No. You haven't, because if they have got a coating on and you file them, you, you will actually destroy the tip and you will end up constantly having to sort of try and tin it. Um, have you tried tinning your tip with some ordinary cord solder? Yes. Does that improve the situation at all or not? No. No, that, that's why I've got this problem. In other words, I'm using you know, this new soldering arm, which I haven't used at the moment. Is uh, you're supposed to put this rose, rose in yeah, on rosin. the tip yeah. first before yeah, you no use it. Yes, normally they recommend with a, with the new iron, you, you you give it a, a coating of some ordinary cord solder, um, such as Multicore or, or one of those one of the well-known solder brands. And and then should all you should really need to do is just wipe it on on a damp sponge, and that it should keep it nice and bright. So you don't need, you don't need this rosin, rosin that they supply in the tin. Yeah, but no, it, it just constantly keeps oxidising up. Yes, so far it has. Yes, I have. Have you, have, have you tried have clean. you tried the damp sponge treatment to it? Or yes. Not? Yes. Start with the damp sponge. But then again, it, it works for five minutes while I'm doing the model, and then it uh, oxidizes up again. Maybe, as you said, that it's reaching too high a temperature. It's, it's got the uh, acid flux on it. Yes, it, it is temperature controlled, I take it, the, the, the iron we're talking no, about, is it? No, no, the, the new one is temperature controlled. That's right, if it's not a temperature controlled iron, basically once it gets hot, it will almost just keep heating. Um, and yes, they, it's probably then sort of causing the end to oxidise. Yeah, this is where I've got a question, really. Is that what's causing it? Yeah, I, 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 without actually sort of trying your iron, I, I think that's what, what the, the, the problem is. You may sort of fare better with your temperature controlled iron where you've got somewhat more control over it. Yes, yes you can drop it down to the temperature of the yeah. solar. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You should maintain that within 60 degrees. Yes, yeah. I think I'll try that. The only worry I've got with it, it says on the box 250 volts, but on the instructions it says 110 volts. So I don't know which one's right. Right. I mean, what I what does it actually say? Normally it would actually state on the handle of the iron what voltage it is. 
Well, it's got the standard uh, European uh, plug on it, so I'm going to plug it in and hope it's all right. What, your temperature controlled one? Yes. Right. You should be, before you plug it in, if it says on the box it's 110 volt, be very, very careful. No, um, no, on the box it says 250 volt. Right. And it's got a 250 volt standard European plug on it. Yeah, one of the sort of, the, the, the sort of shoe code type plugs or? Yeah, it's just a yeah. normal plug. Yeah, yeah. So it, I, I was safer to use it as far as I'm concerned. Okay, yeah. All right. No, that, that, that's fine. But I'm just sort of check, double check on the actual unit itself. It is, it is rated for, for, for 250 volts or 230 volts as we are on in the, the UK. Plug, on the yeah. plug, it says 250 volts. Yeah. 220 yeah. volts. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it'll say 220 to 250. I mean, UK voltage actually is 230 yeah. mo- <laughs> plus 10 minus 6. So, yeah, that's the, the okay. variations you get on it. Yeah. Well, thanks for your help. At least I can go ahead with it. Okay. Um, I think once you go to your temperature control line, you you will probably find you're, you're getting better success than you are with just uh, an iron, which is... Um, just getting hotter and Yeah, hotter. just getting hot, basically. Okay, that's really useful. So test out the new iron, I think, is the yep. answer to that one, Derek. Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, the final question from Derek was about um, using paste flux or um, normal flux. Right. Um, paste flux, normal flux. I With this sort of flux question, it... I tend to sort of say what works for me. And um, I've been using Fry's Power Flow for a long time. It works yeah, for me for soldering on brass and on nickel silver. For soldering on brass and nickel silver, I'm not a great fan of liquid flux because I tend to find it runs everywhere. It um, does. It does. Yeah. And the, the, the thing with Power Flow, it stays where you put it. The downside of it is you do have to clean off, off the residue. But hot water... Um, some it's called SIF now, I believe, isn't it? Anything like that, I'll yeah. take it off. Or um, Viacal is, is another another thing I use. Uh, an old paintbrush and just give it a scrub with some very hot water, and, and it will come off basically because it is yeah. it is water soluble. Thank you very much. Okay, but right. I, I just personally prefer the power flow. Yeah, I think I'll try power flux. Yeah, the liquid one, as you say, runs everywhere. And, and the then you, you can sometimes end up once the flux has run everywhere, the solder will start to run where you don't want it to go. That's it, it does, yeah. yes. Yeah, absolutely. So that, that's why I personally prefer power flow. And I've always said the other great advantage with power flow, you can't knock it over and spill it. No, which I've done. <laughs> yeah. Okay, it's brilliant. Thank you, Derek. Thanks. I'll just Thank meet you. you again if I may, if that's okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Tony, do you want to pick up the questions from Graham Middleton, please? Have I still got Tony's to... muted. Tony's disappeared. I am not muted now. Thank you very much. All right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Derek, from sorry, Graham Middleton asked. He has a London Road Models. Resistance soldering unit, yeah, untried at present, as he is trying to discover what may be the appropriate sort of ground plate to use. Right, probably this needs to be something like a ground flat mild steel, mild steel stock, or are there other options such as right. strong aluminium foil? What would you suggest? Um, I wouldn't go with aluminium foil, I forget that one. You don't need to have sort of ground steel stock. Um, the ground plate I use, I'm about to swing into shot. We'll go, we'll go to the overhead now. Um, this is a piece of, this, I'm afraid this one's rather grubby, ra- ra- rather careworn. It's been around a long time. This started life as what's known as Zintec. Uh, it's used in the automotive industry for basically car body, car chassis repair. This particular piece is, a, well, roughly eight inches by about 12 inches. And it's about a millimetre thick. Now, I tend to use steel. You could use equally use a piece of brass. But the great advantage of using steel is that if you're working on it, you can hold your model down and put some magnets on it. 
that will give you a good solid electrical connection. Uh, this is say barely only a millimetre thick, if that. Uh, it's time probably I replaced it now. You need to keep it clean because you do rely on this for a good sound electrical contact. But certainly you don't need to be worrying about sort of ground stock or anything like that. Because the other disadvantage, if it's very thick, it will act as a heat sink. So do you clean it off with uh, any particular abrasive? Then with any you? particular abrasive, scotch bright. Um, I've got a piece of scotch bright there. That's okay for it. But if it gets a little bit too cruddy, some wet and dry, that's from 600. You might need to go to 400. Because the problem is you do sort of tend to get flux on it and it will sort of start to cause it to corrode on the surface. So every so often you do need to just sort of polish it up. Mm -hmm. And how is it uh, on the corner? I notice you've got some sort of connection to it. Oh, what? right, yeah. Um, what I've got on the corner here, Tony, is a um, this is this is a silicon rubber cable I use, um, which is actually held on there with with a tag, and it's got a, a, a six mil brass bolt through it to to make the the ground connection. Yes, I notice you've got it mounted on a piece of wood. Is that? Uh, yeah, a, that was just tag? basically for convenience, really. Um, we can sort of, where I've got the brass bolt, if you can sort of see here, a pointing object, there we are. Um, I've got a brass bolt there, so obviously you need to sort of recess that in there, which is what I don't say, the whole unit will lay flat, if that sort of, if that sort of makes sense. And it also gives it a little bit of weight as well, so it's not you know, flying around, so it, it, it is quite stable. Yes. Well, that sort of what you said there answers two questions in one, because it was asking what is the optimal size and thickness of the ground plate, and you, if you mentioned you got twelve by eight, and about yeah, another. I mean it's it's well it's for our um our European viewers it's sort of three hundred by three three hundred millimeters by roughly two hundred millimeters. Um, I still tend to work in feet and inches and a lot of things, uh, but yeah, it's sort of roughly three hundred mil by two hundred mil. It could be larger. It possibly doesn't have to be as large as this, but I've, I've found this to be a very convenient size. It can, it can, it's easy to put on your workbench. And yeah, absolutely. Away. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And, and so where might you source such a plate? Uh, I would have... This came from, actually... This, this came from one of my customers, but they happen to have a car body shop, and that's the sort of place you can you can store any sort of steel plate like that. If you've got a, a local-friendly car body shop, pop in and see them, see if they got an off-cut of Zintec or something like that. The advantage with Zintec, when it's new, it has got a very cut, fine coating of zinc over it, which does prevent it from sort of corroding. But this now I've had so long, I think the, the zinc's gone off it and it's starting to corrode in places. And it's sort of coming up for time to re, probably time to replace it. It's, it's been around a long time. That's, that's great, yes. Yeah. Uh, the final part is, is again, the old solder hook, solder paste versus uh, creams or what? what, what, what right. I personally, so again, this, this is a personal thing with me. I, I have tried solder creams and solder pastes and solder paints. I don't particularly like them. I tend to sort of tin everything and then sweat it together with the resistance soldering. Um, oh, sorry, with the resistance soldering unit. Um, solder creams are okay. Some people use them. Some people like them. My, present, my preferences have been just to either use the 145 solder, and in some cases, some of the cord solders I do use for resistance soldering work. I just didn't get on personally with, with solder paste, but it becomes a matter of personal preference. I'm not saying you can't use it. You might try using it and find you get on a good get on with it very well. Personally, I didn't. I found it tended to sort of spit and sort of fly everywhere, where I've, I've got found I had better control with uh, tinning the items and then just sweating them together using the probe on the plate but again it's, it becomes a matter of personal preference would you tin them with an iron then i tin with an iron and then just literally uh, to give you an example i've got a little query coming up in a moment about the not using the resistance soldering iron doing things in the traditional method um if we take this coupling rod for example i would tin that put that on my on my little jig like so Put some flux on the next one put the two together obviously this wouldn't be on wood this would be on the steel plate um so we'll pretend this is a, a conductive surface and then i would just run along there working from the middle outwards with my probe from my resistance soldering unit 
If I do coupling rods, normally what I do, as an example, with a resistance soldering unit, I'll have a couple of holes. I'll drill a couple of holes in the steel plate and put a couple of pins in, and then just literally go on together. This, this comes up with a query later on with uh, not using resistance soldering iron to, to uh, laminate things together. So we'll discuss that one in a moment. But yeah, I, I tend to just tin them with traditional solder using an iron and then finish them off on, on, on the RSU. And at the risk of repeating yourself, Graham's asking which fluxes would you advise? Uh, again, I Fry's power flow. <laughs> <laughs> it's all I ever tend to use apart from when, when we're doing sort of white metal it's a lot of people don't like it but I've, I've used it for a long time and yeah it's uh, I've never had any problems with it yes you've got to wash it off but really and truly any flux you use should, should be neutralised with, with, with hot water Rob well, it's Ian uh, I use the power floor with white metal as well don't have any problems with it no I've, I've not had I've not had any great problems with it but what i've found with um white metal using the phosphoric acid based fluxes like uh, the one that andy duncan markets for instance you do get a, a better joint i find because the capillary action um, of the liquid being drawn into the joint that was the only the the slight advantage i found with it but again that's a matter of sort of personal choice really if it works for you using power flow fine um I'm not saying that's the way you've got to go. You've got to use phosphoric acid for, for white metal, but it, it, it just becomes a personal thing. Mm -hmm. Can yep. we just um, stay on that point, Rob? Because yeah, sure. Jeff Bell actually asked that very specific question. Is there a reason why phosphoric acid is used as a flux when soldering white metal yeah, it, and not power flow? It, it comes back to what I just said. Personally, I, I find that, if I'm soldering white metal together, you can put a drop of um, the phosphoric acid type flux on and it will just literally go into the joint and I find it actually draws the white metal solder into the joint slightly or marginally better than power flow flux will. I hope that just makes that clearer or <laughs> explains that one. Going back to the power flow flux, oh, how right, do you yeah. apply it? Sorry? How do you apply the flow? I use literally, I go into somewhere like a uh, stationary box and I buy a pack of their cheap paint brushes. I think they're about a pound for quite a lot, shall we say. And um, you can't use them all because some of them are quite big, but there's invariably some suitable sized, um, they're basically kiddies paint brushes. And just literally, that's, that's all we do with it. Just a small paint brush like that. And I find that quite sufficient. We'll look at that in a moment when we actually do some soldering. I'll just ask if Graham Middleton's in the room and if he wants to unmute and just let us know if that's answered your question, sir. Hi, everyone. It's Graham here. Um, thanks, Rob. That does answer all my questions. It, 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 I'm slightly bemused by Zintec and body shops, um, but I think I've probably got some body shops somewhere in the area. I'll have a look. Somebody suggested I might get lucky and uh, and find steel plate from Metals for You. Yes, Metals uh, for You. Yeah. Um, yeah. Will I um, it doesn't, just to go back slightly, it hasn't got to be Zintec. Um, no. a, a plain steel sheet will be okay, but you will find that you will start to get corrosion on, on the surface. But then even with the Zintec, you do as I pointed out here. Because mm. once you sanded it down a few times, you lose it in coating, which is obviously protecting it from rusting. Yeah, I'm um, just slightly, you... slightly, slightly surprised that um, uh, it, it doesn't need to be ground flat because if you're soldering long bits of brass like um, coach um, bodies and sides, I would have thought that... Um, yeah, you, yeah, you I can see where you're coming from. You, yeah, the, the, the precision the side of it, yeah. Yeah. But um, you don't find any problems with, um, with I've, using it. I've, one not more had, thing. I've not had a problem. Um, I'm putting a straight edge on that. Yeah. Which is about 12 inches long. So that backing board, what is it? Chipboard or MDF? No, that's, uh, that's MDF. That keeps it flat as well. 
yeah, that that's that would help, wouldn't it? Yeah. And you, the just, thing is, you if just... you go, if you went for a piece of ground stock, I, I, I see your logic, the way, the way you're thinking there. Um, but you may well find that if you're using ground stock, you're going to start getting problems with heat being drawn in, into the yeah in, into the metal. And it's working more like a heat sink. That was what I was worried point. about. The, the, yeah. the thickness. I didn't. I didn't think a millimeter would be thick enough. But um, that's. Yeah, it is. Yeah, that's fine. Um, and I, my various colleagues that sort of use RSUs have got the same sort of setup. And um, yeah, I've I've built coaches on this, and not a problem. Excellent. Thank you very much, Robert. Very much. Okay. Appreciate I hope that, that all made sense to you. Anyway. It does indeed. Thank you. All right. Thank Rob, you. there's a couple of comments come through on the chat. Yeah. Uh, from Dave Smith, he's uh, saying there may be some confusion when referring to the ground plate. You mean ground as in earthed, as opposed yes. to ground as in ground flat. Yeah, yeah. Is that uh, so? That's we're referring to it as an earthing plate. Yes, it is. But, it's basically it, it, it's the the other potential as opposed to the as opposed to the actual probe. It is the the ground. It's not the. It's not ground as in ground flat stock. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and the other thing that Chris Simpson, sorry, Chris Simpson mentioned is, have you tried watering down power flow flux with water to the consistency of milk? No, I haven't. Because he found that that helps drawing the silver into the joint. Right. Okay. That's a. That's probably quite a valid point. Um, yeah. I, the thing I, I tend to find is that when you, if you use power flow flux, and if we're talking about brass here, when you actually put the heat of the iron onto the joint, the the um, paste flux will then start to melt and flow into the joint anyway. So I, I haven't actually found it necessary to water it down and turn it into sort of a, um, a semi-liquid, shall, shall we say. Thank you. Does that, does that answer your question, Chris? Yes, thank you very much. Yes, I, f I find it's fine with uh, a thin consistency. Okay, thank you. And thank you, Dave Smith, for pointing out the difference between ground and ground. Yeah. Yeah, we're, we're talking as ground as earth, basically. And over to you, Jackie. Okay, um, we're going to pick up on some questions from Michael Holland now. Um, there is some discussion, and it's not just come from Michael, about how expensive the RSUs are. And obviously buying a resistance soldering unit is something which people sort of want to be sure about before they lay out the expense. So I think for a few people in the room, it might just be worth mentioning the pros and cons of an RSU, if you would first, and then we'll come on to Michael's specific questions. Right. Um, fours and against uh, RSUs, uh, the only thing that I can personally say against them is the actual capital outlay, the cost. You are looking at spending sort of probably best part of £200 to buy a commercially made unit. And the one I've got is a semi-homemade thing. Um, it's been around a long time. But yeah, if you go out and buy the London Road Models 1 or the Swanage 1, which I think they all... They've got a retail of somewhere between about 185, 200 pounds, something, something of that nature. So it is quite a big outlay um, from the modeling point of view. I know a lot of clubs will often buy them and sort of loan them out to members. So there is sometimes that option. Uh, as far as the advantages over a soldering iron go, they are great for clean build. They are great for adding um, detail. If we can just flip to the, the overhead. Thank you, Jamie, to the overhead. Um, I'll put on sort of detail like these lamp irons we can see here. I hope you can see those, anything like that. And they've just literally been soldered on, tinned on the back, and then just popped in place and held in place with the RSU. One of the great advantages with, with an RSU, I haven't got it on the ground plate of this, but uh, assuming this was on the ground plate, and I haven't got my cable caught up, which I now, I've now just released. You can hold the item in place with the tip, put your foot on the foot pedal, activate the unit, and literally just solder it in place, take your foot off the foot pedal, keeping the probe in place. And unlike a soldering iron, the probe's now gone cold, so you've not got to sort of 
try and hold this in place with a screwdriver and get a soldering iron onto it and so forth. It, it just makes it that much simpler than it is with a soldering iron. I'm not saying you can't do it with a soldering iron because obviously you can, but it's just a, a much easier operation to do. Uh, again, where you have to install overlays or anything of that nature, they are much easier to do with an RSU. And I, I mean, I'll put in things like uh, these, the buffer housings, the buffer stocks, I'll put those in place with an RSU simply by holding the, the probe here away from the white metal, this having been previously tinned with some white metal solder, and then sort of put some flux on it and then let the heat of the probe run through the brass, flash off the white metal solder and just let the, the buffer stock go in, into position. Um, something I, I do continuously. Um, don't ever be tempted to put the actual probe anywhere near the white metal because you will completely destroy it. Just let the heat sort of permeate through through the brass into the joint. Um, I didn't. I worked for a long time with not having one of these, but once I got one, I wouldn't be without it. And um, if this one ever dies, I will simply just replace it. I can't say much more than that about RSUs. I think anyone that's got one and uses one will probably sort of back up what I say. Okay. Um, if we can then just think about Michael's questions, which I know you've had a, a look at and, and yep. started to think about. Michael was basically saying that there are situations where you're using the resistance soldering unit. Yep. And how would you do those techniques with a conventional iron? So right. if we okay. start with laminating a connecting rod. Right. I, it just so happens in the best um, blue piece of tradition, I happen to have <laughs> a coupling rod here that uh, I've made up a little jig before we started this session tonight. So literally what we've got, we've got a wooden block. Get this if, if I can get this one off here. Wooden block, two pins. We'll pop our first part of the lamination on. And what I'm now going to do is put some flux of some power flow flux on there. And I'll just put some flux on there just to sort of get that ready for the solder. I'm using some 145 solder. I've just sort of cleaned the tip of my soldering iron. I'm just going to tin that out like so. We'll now take the centre section. Now, in the case of this one, all I'm going to do is put some flux on here like so. I hope you can see all this. It's a good view. Thank you, Rob. Let's get some flux on there. Just a coating. We'll lay that onto the jig like so. And now I'm just literally going to put my iron on there and just sweat the two together. I notice you nearly put your finger on there to hold it together. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm glad you're taking notice, notice Mr. Cow. And then literally we'll do the same with the next layer. We'll put some solder onto this one. That's still very hot from the tip of the iron. Another drop of solder on there. Just tin that one out. And the final layer, I'm just gonna put some flux on that. Making sure the tip of the iron is clean now because what we don't want to do is get any flux on the outside, at least the bare minimum. If I find a suitable instrument, I'll just a screwdriver or some such thing. There we go. 
to hold that down. We can just sweat these two together. And you probably can't see it on the screen, but I can just sort of see the solder flashing off. Now, sometimes you will get a, the merest trace of solder, but that will clean off a little fiberglass brush in a moment. Just sweat those together. This is much simpler than RSU, but it is doable with an iron. That is the way I used to do them. Probably still quite hot, actually. Yeah, it is. But the excess solder can just literally be cleaned off with a fiberglass brush or pencil. And there we have one coupling rod laminated together. You see that? Oh, I've taken it out of shot now. There we go. There we have one coupling rod laminated together without the use of an RSU. Brilliant, thank you. I know there's a couple more things from my... Right, the other one, I think, on, on that same query was boiler bands, was it not? Mm, yes. Was. Mm. Right. Okay, boiler bands, a similar process. I need a piece of plywood back. Um, I've partially tinned this one, but I will just tin the underside of it. Let's just give that a little rundown. These are only about three thousand inch thick, so they're quite uh, they're quite delicate. So again, I would just literally tin that, making sure to tip the irons clean. Now for this, you do need sort of a reasonably powerful iron because boilers tend to sort of work as quite a strong heat sink. Um, let's just polish this sample of boiler up. This is only a half boiler, obviously, from a tank engine. But uh, I would then run some flux in the area that I want the boiler band to go. Try and get this on straight. And this is where little crop clips come in very useful. This is where I drop the boiler band on the floor. <laughs> it's all right, no pressure. You've only got 50 people watching you. No, no, no pressure, Jackie. <laughs> I'm used to making a fool of myself every day of the week, so there we go. Right. Oh. Now, we've got that on there like so. I can pull that round and just literally heat that with my iron. I've got asbestos fingers. I should point that one, that fact out. Right? You can actually see what I'm doing here, but there we go. It's now getting rather warm. A little bit more flux on there. Do you ever use wooden clothes pegs? Yep. Wooden clothes pegs, crocodile clips, anything that's sort of convenient. Blue tack, we'll come to that in a moment. So there we are. We've now got our boiler band soldered on in what I would say with the traditional method. And I think you'll find, I don't know if the camera's going to pick that up actually, but that is actually sort of a clean job. It's a very clean job. Yes, it is. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Is that answer your query, Michael? Are you happy with that? Yes, I am. Thank you. Uh, but what size was the iron that you used? That's to a 45 that watt iron. 45. Yeah. Because um, boiler well, bands, the, the slight issue you'll get soldering on a boiler band yeah. um, on a full boiler is obviously. The boiler is going to work as quite a big heat sink for the iron, and it will it will draw yes, the heat yeah, away from yeah. the iron. Um, this is only a half boiler. Um, in theory, sort of a 45, 50 watt, 60 watt iron should should cope with it. But if you find the solder isn't flowing, you might need to just go up a little bit in the the wattage of the iron. Well, the reason I was asking about that is that is a, a six month old um, Weller tip. Uh, an iron coated tip which has been 
is a 40, 45 watt tip. Yep. Uh, and that has been prepared and treated the way that you've always, uh, that you've been recommending, except right. that it's not temperature controlled. And you can right. see it's not exactly in, if I can get it in the right place on the, where are we? Uh, I had it in my hand a moment ago. Um, yes, I think I think saw you waving it about. Yeah, um, I'm trying to get it in focus again. There we are. Um, you can yeah. see it's not exactly in pristine condition. No. And I, I seem to find that the larger the the tip that's used, the more quickly it needs uh, cleaning. Yeah, yeah. It, to, to an extent, it will do. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Um, I mean, this this is actually quite a, the tip I'm using here. Let's see if the camera will pick that up. Can we see that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, that's basically just a, it's just described as a screwdriver tip for obvious yeah, reasons. Yeah, well, that, that's what this yeah. is, as you can Yeah, um, can that's see. quite an old tip. That, that, that's been around a long time. Six months old. Oh, this, this, one's, this one's much, much older than that. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, yeah, I, I do I do tin it regularly. I do keep it clean with a damp sponge all the time. Mm. And pretty much every time I go to sort of make a joint, you'll see me dab it on the sponge. Yeah, well, just, I, I do that. And I always yeah. tin it when I finish soldering um, as, as well. So it's tin, ready tin for the next yeah. uh, session. The only thing I haven't got is that brass, uh, those brass uh, scrap cleaning uh, things. That's the yeah. only thing I haven't got. They, yeah, these these are worth, these are really worthwhile. Um, yeah. Getting hold yeah, of those I, I, because I'm, they, I'm they, they will that, take certainly. off. They're not abrasive in the, in, in the extent of a filer would be abrasive. That's right. They're, mm. they're, they're abrasive enough to remove any um, oxidisation. Yeah. The, 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 the sponge won't take off. And then, um, as I say, these these little tip cleaner tins. Yeah, I, I, I've got some of that. Yeah, they, they, they're worth every penny. And this, mm. They're quite mm. expensive. I mean, they are about nine, ten pounds for a little tin, which always seems to me to be crazy. But I've had that one... Oh, Years now, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it's yeah, it's still there. Yeah, that that's fine, uh, Rob. Thank you very much. You're more than welcome. Um, before we go on to attaching overlays, Tony, do you want to pick up on some of the questions that have arrived in chat? Because there's quite a few comments here now. Yes, certainly. Uh, just one of the comments has been. Ian Allen's found uh, Swanage Models RSU. They're re retailing at £195. Yep. That's 2018 price, but uh, there probably won't be much difference. Um, and John and Christine Walker have found out that A4 sheets of Zintec, 0.8 millimetres thick, are £6 and a penny, including post and package, on eBay. Excellent. Moving on to some questions. Are there any things to look out for when soldering steel? Um, Richard Smith has got uh, a kit where the coupling holds are steel. The rest of it is brass and white metal. So is there anything to look out for with soldering steel? The, cup, the coupling rods are steel. That's what he says, yes. Yeah, I, I wouldn't have thought if, if they're made of steel, I mean, steel will solder. But normally, if the coupling rods are made of steel, I, I would guess more likely they're, they're, they're milled steel coupling rods rather than laminated ones that you tend to get with um, the nickel-silver type coupling rods. And I, I can't really see you would need to solder them. Richard, you... online. Um, yeah. Um, no, they are actually an etching, and they are steel. Oh, they're, 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 they're a steel etching. Yeah, and they're a laminate. Oh, right. Okay, I stand corrected. Um, no, you shouldn't have any problem soldering them. If you find that power flow doesn't work, you may have to resort to, say, phosphoric acid, which is a slightly more aggressive flux than power flow fluxes. That, that may be the only issue, but I, I wouldn't have thought you would have a problem soldering them. Okay, that's kind. Thank okay. You. Yep, yep. Uh, moving on then, Peter Allen says he's got a London Road Models RSU. Yep. He hasn't used it a long time, mainly because the plastic probe handle melted. Is the yeah, that thing can... Wrong? The first time he used it, the plastic probe handle melted. This actually isn't... I think this is a London Road... Um, although this is a sort of semi-homemade unit, 
Um, these probes do melt, and I've got another one somewhere that's probably no, I can't find it. Now. I have another one. Um, they do melt if you're using it continuously. They this piece does get very very hot, and you have to sort of judge the fact whether it's getting hot and sort of back off a little while and let it cool down or cool it down. Um, they but they can melt. Uh, so if you're doing a lot of work with it continuously, I have had them melt here. Uh, I think this is about the second or third probe I've had because I did manage to destroy one. Um, so I, all I can suggest is that he may have been using it for long periods of time, perhaps on laminations or, or, or something like that, because that's the only time I've actually ever had a problem with these if I've been doing some laminating work with it. And it, it's been in constant use and this the heat starts to build up and this can become soft. I actually keep meaning to make another one of these out of a different material. Because I think this is, uh, um, I don't think it's actually plastic in the in the usual sort of sense of the word, it's plastic. It's a uh, Dalrin or something like that. It's possibly what they are. I don't know how well that mounts, but I think this is what these are actually made out of. Well, he's also saying, where can you get a better pro? Uh, well, um, now, these probes, they came from, oh, my God, I can't think of the name of the chap. Lincolnshire Way. Jackie, remind me. Used to, used to have, used to have this, the, the small stand, um, about 12-foot square stand at most shows. I think you had a st stand at your show. Um, John's saying, so, John, unmute and tell people. I can't think of his name. Can't hear it. Uh, John Neeshaw here. Uh, you're thinking of Phil Atkinson, as in Hobby That's Hobby the man? Days. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you're very Hobby well. Bye-bye. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, John. Yeah, I, I can't think of his name. I, was, <laughs> I knew exactly who I meant, but I can't. Yeah, he, he was the guy that I always used to, used to buy the probes from. So that's uh, Hobby Holidays. Hobby Holidays, that's it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Peter, does that answer your question? Thank you. Yes, it does. Very, very, thank you very much. Um, yeah. I'm looking forward to getting using it again. Then, if I yeah. get a probe. Yeah, if you can, if you can get one from Hobby Holidays, um, they, they will. You know, if you if you continuously work them, they will get hot and they, they will melt. Um, but yeah, I, this is a Hobby Holidays one, and it, it's been very good. Okay, great. Thank you very much. So, so moving on to a, a comment made by Dr. Dave, uh, he's saying that using soldering iron to carry, carry solder to the joint, he was always under the impression that you use the iron to heat the joint and then apply the solder. Quite so, correct if you're doing electrical soldering. Um, when you're soldering uh, an electrical joint, you heat the joint with a, with a clean tip of the iron and then apply a cord solder to it. Um, this is something I've, I've often described before. If you take, um, this is this is electrical solder, cord solder. If you try and do this, if you can see it on the, yeah, you can see all the smoke probably on the screen. That's all my flux burning away. And what you don't want is the flux to burn away when you're doing an electrical joint. So as our colleague rightly says, I'll just give you a quick example. I can find a little bit of scrap grass somewhere. I'm sure I can, but I'll get it out of the bag. Bear with me a moment. Talk amongst yourself. There we go. Right. Um, this is obviously sort of about 190 sold or something of that, that nature. If we wanted to solder onto there to say make an electrical joint or something like that, we're using wire side of a rail and we were using... Um, Rosin cord solder, literally put the iron onto the joint and then introduce the solder and the solder will then flow into it. This is a much higher melting temperature than the 145 that we use for, for um, brass and nickel silver construction. But in this case, when we're working with brass and nickel silver, we're using a separate flux and applying it to the joint. In that case, it's quite acceptable to put the solder onto the iron and transport it to the joint if that makes sense. It's, it, it, it's, they're both soldering connections, but they are different methods of achieving 
um, a solder joint. Certainly for electrical soldering, you apply the heat to the joint and add the solder. If you're doing effectively sheet metal work with brass or nickel silver, you're using a separate flux and a separate solder which doesn't contain flux and you can then transport the solder to the joint on the iron. But it won't work if you're using res rosin cord solder. Okay. Is that all right, right Dave? Dave? Yeah, thumbs up from Dave. Okay, thank you. Uh, what material are the jig pins used so you don't get that sold to the coupling rods? <laughs> right. This was this was something I, I, I knocked out very quickly before we we um started this session this evening, and they're literally two galvanized panel pins. And um, yeah, they, they haven't taken solder to them because they're not clean. They're actually probably quite grimy as far as soldering goes, and the solder didn't stick to them, which I was hoping it wouldn't for the demonstration. <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> John Shaw has suggested that you can use le leather thimbles from eBay to protect your little pinkies when you're holding hot things. Yes, indeed you can, John. <laughs> Thank you, John. Uh, and Alex has found it interesting about soldering. Uh, when he goes to his local hobby centre, he's going to try some soldering and he's going to try and be brave. Now, it's Michael. Worrying. It's worrying when you do it the first time. I know that. I can remember when I did soldering for the first time, but it's really worth giving it a go, Alex. I'd agree with you, Jackie, but also I do it with confidence as well. But it, it's understandable I don't have confidence. But I'm assuming you have, Rob. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I'll try and have a go and, and try not let you down. Okay. Good man. Ma Michael Schumacher has mentioned that he knows has noticed when using calcareous water to clean the tip. It causes a white deposit on the tip. Have you got any comment to make about that? Sorry, I, I never quite caught that, Tony. Yeah, when... you use calcareous water. I'm not sure what calcareous water is. No, 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 no myself. I, I, I don't know. I mean, whenever I clean up brass kits, I, I, I used to use. Um, oh God, what was it called now? Oh, hot hot bright. No, not hot bright. Um, uh, uh, shiny sinks. That was it. I used to use shiny sinks, and I've sort of gone away from that and, and tend to use uh, Vical. I found with shiny sinks, it, it does what it says on the tin, as they say, but it, it leaves a chalky white residue. And Vical actually strips everything nice and clean and bright, and it, it, it tends to rinse off uh, very easily as well. Doesn't leave anything behind. It does actually discolour the solder, but that doesn't really matter. It, it sort of turns the solder sort of, sort of a little bit blackish, but uh, I don't really think that sort of matters as such because it's going to get painted anyway. Right. Uh, and then, then next there's uh, Jan or Jan, I'm not sure which it is, Cockleburn, is saying, do you have any experience with using Carr's 138 soldering cream? You can't get the 138 and stick two parts together. Right. No, again, I unfortunately, solder cream is something I can't comment on because I've, I've tried using it, didn't particularly like it, and just, and just went back to using traditional sort of forms of soldering. Um, yeah. Uh, so as far as the car's solder creams go, I'm afraid that's something I can't really comment on. Okay. Um, uh, John, John Nishaw has just said, I like, I like car's... 179 solder clean with the RSU, it works for me. Fine. If it works for you, great. I prefer just to use solder. Um, as I've said all along, you know, the methods I use might not be for everybody, but they, they, they've worked for me over the years. Uh, if you like solder cream, fine, go with it. But it's just, it becomes a matter of personal choice. It's what works for you. If you try something, it works, and you get on with it, great. Um, fine. An earlier question regarding what the pins were made with when you made the uh, the con rods. Yep. Um, somebody's mentioned if you use blackening fluid on them. Yeah, if you oh. yeah, I, I saw that one. If you use the chemical blackening that you can you can put onto on, onto mild steel, it will prevent solder taking to it. Yeah, it's a very very valid point. Thank you very much for that one. Okay, Jackie, over to you again. 
Okay, um, it was the final part of um, Michael's question was using a traditional line for attaching overlays. Right. Um, unfortunately, I haven't got a suitable overlay that I can I can demonstrate with, but the principle is very, very similar to um, doing the coupling rods, where I would, with an overlay, I'd be inclined to tin both parts, the 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 the, the thicker brass part that you're attaching the overlay to and probably the back of the overlay itself. And then when the overlay is installed, working from the middle to the outside, because you can cause expansion, you can cause the overlay to buckle. So basically starting in the middle of the overlay with a, with a nice clean iron so you're not depositing any solder on it and then working to the outside of the overlay. Um, if we take the case in point sort of something like this, um, so basically we, we drop our overlay in with both pieces tinned and with some extra flux in and then just literally putting the iron on and working towards the outside, probably holding it down with a, a screwdriver as, as, as we work along and then just letting the heat go into the overlay and working towards the end. So if there is any expansion, it's being sort of pushed towards the outer edges. That is about sort of the best I can really describe that, that situation. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, Jan's just come back in response to John Nishaw's comment just to say that the 179 solder cream with the RSU works well for him as well. It just, uh, what, sorry, the, yeah, the 178, is 138 rather, is the one that doesn't work well. Um, okay. So if anybody has any comment about the 138, perhaps they can just type it into chat and we can pick that one up shortly. Okay. Okay, the next one is from David Lunn. Um, I use a 70 watt temperature controlled soldering iron and 145 or 70 degree solder. I need to laminate two pieces of brass about six centimeters by 15 centimeters its size together. This was an engine foot plate, so there were various cutouts in it. I found it very difficult and wondered how you would go about it. Um, obviously, he's, he, perhaps he doesn't possess an RSU because I would personally do it with an RSU, having having tinned both sections and then set them together and then gone over the RSU. But in, in the absence of an RSU, again, I would tin both parts and sort of literally run the iron around the edge, again, working from the middle outwards, um, and hopefully then we, we could sweat the two together. But there may be a bit of jigging involved literally to hold them solid while, while you were carrying the operation out. David, are you around online to unmute and just um, let Yes, know? Yes, I am, thanks. So Thank you. you'd only solder, basically solder around the edges. You wouldn't be... Well, to... yeah, um, you would need to sort of flux them, but I, I would actually tin them to start with. Had, had you tinned... Um, both surfaces, David. I think I may only have done one of them. Yeah, I I would have been inclined to tin both surfaces, and then put a generous amount of flux on, get them together, and then run the iron round the edge, and not moving the iron very quickly, but working effectively from the middle outwards, much like I was talking about the laminations, and then sort of squeezing them together, holding them together with a screwdriver. A little bit of a faff because I, I would prefer to do it the RSU myself. But, yeah, you could achieve it with an iron, but it, it's a little bit tedious. But you would need sort of quite a good iron. And if you've got a 70-watt iron, I thought I would think that would put enough heat into it to try it. Oh, sorry, to, to, to allow the solder to take. Right, OK, thank you then. So... Any cutouts, you'd go around the edges of those as yeah, well. Yeah, just go around the edges of the cutouts as well and just and just let the heat get it, get into the joint. Don't move the iron too quickly. You need to let the, the heat of the iron get into it. Um, you can't just literally wipe the iron across the surface. It's, you've got to let the heat of that iron actually go into the joint. And actually, as John's just put up on the screen, a very good point, microgas. Uh, one of the little... The, um, little um, gas soldering irons, very good for that sort of thing. Unfortunately, it's not the sort of thing we can demonstrate. It shows they can tend to get a bit upset if you produce a naked flame. But if you're in your home workshop, yeah, you can do it. But one sort of word of warning there, if you're using sort of a, one of the small gas soldering irons, is watch what you can cause distortion to the brass. 
with with the heat. Okay, fine. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yep, that answers my question. Um, David, your second question was about getting solder to stay on the tip of the soldering iron and that you'd bought some tip cleaner, which seemed to work well. And then a few minutes later, it's as bad as it was before. Has the demonstration about tip cleaning and things covered that for you now, or is there something else you wanted to add on that? No, I think Rob's covered um, my thought. And, and in fact, only in the last couple of days, I thought I wondered if I'm running it at too high a temperature and it's oxidized. Yeah, I, I think that, that that's possibly the cause. You, you're actually cook, you're, you're cooking the tip, basically. I mean, do, what sort of temperature? You haven't mentioned um, temperature controlled irons. That are well, yeah, I mean, I, I use a temperature controlled iron, which, which is a weller, but it's not an adjustable one in the sense of um, I've got a knob that I can turn to to adjust the temperature. The temperature is actually set by the type of tip that's used and the, the type of uh, thermostat that's built into the... Sorry, we, we, we can keep on this. Um, these particular tips that I use, if I can find one somewhere. Um, if you're using 145 solder, you don't really need this sort of temperature control way on fat out to sort of four 500 degrees or whatever. You need to come back a bit. You need to be... a, a um, a temperature where your solder is going to melt and flow easily, which is more by perhaps experimentation with your particular iron than say you need to be at X amount of degrees. It's just basically experimentation with the, with, with the equipment you've got to see how well it works for the particular um, operation you're putting it to. Okay, thanks. As I say, it's only the last couple of days I suddenly thought that might be the problem. Yeah, so, I so would try just I don't, just, just try backing your temperature down a little bit and, and, and see what that does. Um, if if that's okay, then come back a little bit more as well. You know, just just have enough heat for the actual operation you're doing. And yeah. you, you might find that if you're putting on a big chunk of brass, you might need to increase the temperature a little bit, you know, just, just sort of up, up and down the scale. It's it's something you'll get used to as, as you go on, you know. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. All right, okay. Um, Graham's just come back in, um, going back to the RSU earthing plate. He can get Zintec at 0.8 millimetres or 1.2 millimetre, but not one millimetre. So which thickness would you go for? Well, um, I, I bet if I measure this, it's probably 0.8. Um, I can't see an issue with using 1.2. One, 1.2 1 1 would probably be okay. Um, I don't think 1.2 millimetres would create too much of a heat sink. Um, I'd have thought either the 0.8 or the, or, or the 1.2, really. Either, I think, will be fine, Jackie, in that case. Is that okay, Graham? Yeah. Okay, um, John and Christine Walker have said that they find the RSU really useful for separating laminations that have gone wrong. Yep, absolutely. So start from one end, follow the pa with paper between the laminates to yep. keep them apart. Um, so that's obviously another um, good thing about having. They're the also RSU. they're also great for taking kits apart that have been badly put together in the first place. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, and John Nishaw's just said that uh, the late lamented Bob Alderman, who I'm yep. sure many people will know, um, recommended an iron temperature of twice the melting point of the yep. solder. Yep. So, so yeah, basically, if you're using a 145 yeah. solder. If you're using 145 and if you're running at about 300 degrees, you should be fine. Um, and it shouldn't cook the tip. But if you start cranking up to about 400 degrees, on, which you can on a lot of these irons, you, you may well start cooking the tip and it's going to oxidise very quickly. Okay. Tony, shall I have that to you for the questions from Robin Cooper, please? I don't know whether I've got the questions from Robin Cooper. I've got a question from Robin Cooper. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a question from Robin Cooper, the photograph, I believe. Is that the one we're talking about? That's right. I'm just wondering if I can show people the photograph as well. Let me just see if they're right. I can bring the photograph up if everybody wants oh, to. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Um, so it basically says um, the second point, I will come back to the first one, is getting everything in exactly the right position, initially the lower angle was in one continuous piece to aid keeping things better positioned. Um, 
any hints, please, about effective ways of setting multiple pieces in position? Right. Okay. I don't know if, don't know if Robin's online and wants to just explain this picture while it's on screen and what you were actually busy doing. Oh, yes. Good evening, everybody. Um, this is a, 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 a footstep support for breakdown. Um, and they're very small pieces, well, one millimetre channel, two millimetre angle. So the um, area of contact was only two square millimetres. Uh, and, and there are several different, it's a bit like a ladder in shape. Uh, you can see a, a completed version at the top of the picture. Um, the, the, the bottom is, it shows how I had to cut a gap for the axle boxes in the, in the lower angle. And the, that cutting action broke the end solder connection that, that did form the T, the T shape. Um, so that meant I had an even more number of pieces to try and assemble in the correct position um, to, to hold while they're being soldered together. So my, my question in this regard was any hints regarding the best way to position the items and, and hold them in, 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 in that position, please? Right. OK, Robin. Um, I, I saw your message come through and I, I, I quickly put together um, a very fairly crude jig. Um, I hope I can answer your question. I'll try the best I can. What I've got here is a very simple jig. Um, the spacing of these blocks at the moment will, will all become apparent in a little while. Um, basically, I've got a piece of plywood base and I've got some, these are actually little pieces of Paxlin. They could quite equally be some pieces of thin strip wood with nice square edges. To start with, what I would do, I'd create this little jig by putting on my brass angle. Hold that on with a little piece of masking tape like so. The same on this one. These pieces of Paxlin, by the way, they're literally held down with just double-sided tape, but they could equally be glued. You could make up a, a little jig for your for your spacing. The brass has been thoroughly cleaned. I sort of did that beforehand. Now the next thing I would do, I would use this wonderful stuff here, blue tack. Uh, well then, this is all actually one by one by one angle, actually. So I know you were using sort of one millimeter and uh, two millimeter angle. Um, I'm going to solder this together. I'm going to put a little bit of power flow flux on this just for the moment, just there. Now, I'm not going to use 145 solder. I'm actually going to use some electrical solder on this because it's a slightly higher mounting temperature and it is actually slightly stronger. So I'm just going to pop that down there with a screwdriver. That is actually now a very strong joint on there. I'm going to put a little bit of flux on that one there. Hold that down with my screwdriver. A little bit more electrical solder on, the, on my iron. And again, we've now got a very strong joint there. What I've just done there, does that, can we see that? Let's just try it on the other camera, Jim. Let's see if I can get this in, in shot. I've taken it off the jig and it's actually pulled it away from the masking tape, but that, that's fine. That's what we wanted to do. So there we go. That's what we've ended up with. And these, are really strong and well, that's actually one by one angle i've got there probably looks bigger in the camera but uh, there we go is that what you were hoping to achieve hello you're still there yeah can anybody hear me i can hear you robin are you still there yes i'm right does that help at all, Robin? Yes, thank you. 
yeah. We've actually now got a very strong connection there. What did you cut the brass with, by the way? A saw. Yeah, I mean, was it a little sort of powered saw in a, in a mini drill type thing? or a? No, it was just a, a simple hand, hand saw. Yeah, um, I'd have probably used sort of a piercing saw with a very fine blade to sort of keep the stress level down or supported it and cut it with a small cutting disc in a mini drill. OK, thank you. Yeah? Yes. I, I hope that makes sense. I mean, obviously, if you were making up the pieces for your breakdown that you were, these these spacings would need to be correct for the, the, the staunchings, as it, as it were. But yes. um, that, yes. that's the principle I would use. Um, but as I say, I, for a joint like that, I would use something like an electrical solder applied in the way that I've just shown because it is slightly stronger than the, the 145 solder. But, yeah, I mean, if I get a hold of that, I'll probably break it off. But, I mean, you know, it's not going to go anywhere at the moment, as you can see. Yeah. Yeah. So, thank you. All right? Yeah. I hope it's been of some use. Yeah. Yes, thank you. All right. Thank you, Robin. I hope that's covered off your queries. Yes. Um, thank you. Looking at the chat, um, Peter Alton... Please, please, any tips for making valve gear and soldering the locking nuts rather than the whole lot together? So, locking nuts. Um, right, when we're talking about, are, are we talking about putting in sort of like the rivets into valve gear and so forth and soldering them all? I'm not quite sure yeah. what it, I mean, what I normally do if I assemble valve gear, if I'm using rivets, for example, I'll, I'll literally put pieces of paper between them, sandwich them, put the rivet through and just solder on the back. Um, that's, that's, what I was, that's what I was looking for, yeah. Yeah. So just bits of paper, just use all Yeah, paper. I mean, obviously not fairly thin paper and then mm. pass the rivet through, then care, make sure everything is clean on sort of the rivet on, on where you want the solder to go but not cleaned up, shall we say, where you don't want it to go. And that, that will sort of aid the solder not sort of flowing through the whole thing. It tends to be sort of a fairly quick swipe with a, with a, with a nice hot clean iron and a, a drop of sort of flux and solder, you know, not dwelling too long because capillary action will tend to take it through and you, you'll end up sort of seizing the valve gear up. Okay. Okay. Okay, thank you. All right. John Nishaw's recommended cigarette papers yep. soaked in oil. Excellent. I, 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 would, I would second that. Alternatively, I've used uh, aluminium foil. Yeah. Alum Again, it's what, what, what works for you. I mean, so I, I've, used, I've used just paper. I've not ever had a problem. I don't think I've actually ever had it bind up with solder. But, yeah, uh, John's so soaked in oil, fine. Aluminium foil there from Sony, yeah, great. Um, and then John and Christine Walker have said they find the power ladder on a digital solder station really useful. It shows how much power is drawn. No power, no heat flow. Yeah. OK, any other questions from anybody else? We've got about 10 minutes left before we finish off. Um, we don't have to stay here till 9.30, obviously, but it's your chance to just ask Rob if there's any other questions. Okay, can I ask a question, please? Yes, please do. <coughs> Rob, I've got a fr frost iron issue, which is about 100 quid. Sorry, I, I can't hear you very clearly. <laughs> can you hear me now? Yeah, go on, try, try, far away. I have a frost R issue, which is around 100 quid. Yep. It's half the price of the um, London Road. A I frost R issue? Yes. Not one I'm familiar with, but carry on. Now, the big criticism that has been voiced on the forum is that they're, in the standard form, they're a bit powerful. Now, could you use with an R issue? A dimmer switch to rewind the power down? Um, no. Uh, you couldn't put an, a, a dimmer switch on the RSU purely and simply because normally RSUs have, uh, are, an, are an inductive load. Um, they're a transformer, and it wouldn't be, it, I certainly wouldn't advise putting a dimmer switch onto the ingoing side of the RSU. But is there not any method of 
Um, altering the output of the RSU. Yeah, that's the problem. Um, that's sorry? The, that's the problem. It's right, it, it, it's one fixed output, is it? Yes. Right. Um, when you're saying Frost, is that the company that supply automotive bits and pieces? Yes. Right, okay, yeah, they're, they're an American organisation, I believe, aren't they? I don't know, because they've got a Birmingham office. Yeah, um, yeah, I only know a Frost from, yeah. Yes, Frost also motive restoration technology is coming from Dave Smith. The only way I think you could alter the input of your um, RSU is not using a dimmer switch because we're dealing with an inductive load where really it's not, I would say no. You, you need what you ideally need is a variac, a variable transformer. You can sort of pick them up, probably from eBay and places like that, and it, it will swing from sort of zero volts to 230 volts. Uh, that would be okay to alter the output of your RSU. Okay, thanks. Okay. That's what I wanted to establish. All right. But don't don't try using a dimmer switch. Uh, use a variable transformer. Okay. Okay. They are available. It's just, it's just literally a rotary control. They tend to be a bit chunky. Um, the other thing you could try doing, um, if you've got a friend who's got a 110 volt transformer, the sort of things we use on building sites, try plugging it into that and see see what it does. Yeah. In other words, you've cut the input voltage in half pretty much and sort of see what your output then becomes. Yeah. In theory, it should be half the output you're getting now. Yeah. Before you before you start spending money on sort of variable transformers. Understood. Okay. Thanks a lot. All right. Thank you, Philip. Anything from anybody else, you feel free to um, just say that you'd like to ask a question and capture the moment while we've got Rob to uh, share his expertise. Okay. Yeah. We've, it's all gone very quiet all of a sudden. So, Michael, you want to come back in? Yes, please, uh, Jackie. Uh, Rob, the uh, those brass shavings that you used, um, yeah. are they actually, uh, it, is it a sort of cleaner that's available from... Yeah, uh, um, these, this, this one probably came from Squires Tools. Ah, right, yeah that, yeah, that was what I was wondering, because that's the one thing uh, that you've used that I, I, I haven't yeah. got. You, basically, you can, um, Michael, you, you can buy the... Um, complete thing that i've got here yeah um you may even find them on the internet right mm. but uh, they've also got a little soldering iron stand on them as well you can actually use them with a, a stand oh, like that. yeah yeah um fine yeah yeah but so squires tools um eileen's emporium mm. and so, they're the go-to the places aren't they <laughs> yeah yeah um and in fact when they get um worn out although i've had this one a long time and it's not worn out you can yeah. actually normally buy just the, the replacement innards um, right mm -hmm. yeah and temperature controlled irons yeah. um is that a sort of specific iron or I mean, presumably you, you can't uh, adapt an existing iron to be temperature controlled other than by using something like a dimmer switch or yeah whatever. you you can you can run an iron through a dimmer switch yeah, hmm. um, because it, it's effectively a resistive load. So the traditional sort of dimmer switch that you, you'd have had in the house will normally work um, most irons. I hmm. actually, when I when I demonstrate, I've got a little dimmer, uh, little thing made up with a with a dimmer switch to switch to control an iron for hmm. white metal soldering. Hmm. So you can use pretty much any iron for white metal soldering, but a, a true temperature controlled iron. Um, they are made by various companies. Antex, uh, mm. a well-known iron. Walla, mm. do one. They tend to be the more commercial variety of iron, more so than the the um, the uh, sort of DIY type iron. Yeah, therefore are more robust. Yeah, they but they they are far more versatile and they will keep their temperature. Where if you take an iron like this little fifteen watt Antex I've got here, yeah, uh, mm. that's it. Got it in yeah. shot now. 
I mean, that is a traditional iron. You plug that in, it's 15 watts, and it just keeps heating up, basically. Um, so, yeah, it's it's not as good as, say, an iron like that, which is a commercial iron, which is designed for use day in, day out in a workshop. Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. that's designed for sort of occasional hobby use. That's that's the difference, really. You know? Yeah. Mm. And are these obviously you, you will pay a premium for? Mm, mm, mm. Okay. Yes, thank you. All right. Um, there's a web link in chat if people can see it. We'll make sure it gets added to the video. Um, but Ian Allen has posted that and it will take you directly to where you can find the um, brass balls of, um, of for cleaning your iron with. I don't know what else to call it except for a brass ball of scraps really it's just basically it's it, it's a ball of brass for foremost <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. um and one last question there from john nishaw what's your preferred solder for attaching white metal casting to brass can you can you repeat that one jackie what's your preferred solder for attaching white metal castings to brass 70 degree solder. That's all I ever tend to use. I tend to tin the brass with the uh, 70 degree white metal solder and then use some phosphoric acid type flux and then just some heat and let the two go together. Just basically tin, tin the casting, tin the, tin the brass, put the two together with some heat, either from an iron or from an RSU. But don't put the iron on the white metal casting put it on the brass and let the heat go through the brass to melt the white metal solder and, and sweat the two together. Okay. Okay. Um, and Andrew Jones just asked, how do you solder white metal to white metal? Right. If you can give me a couple of minutes, I'll let the iron heat up from a, from a white metal soldering. We'll solder some white metal together. You might find some bits of casting. Go into this bag of bits and pieces I've got here. There we are. Loads of loads of white metal castings, old scrap ones. Right. Yeah, if people haven't seen it, I will just say that there is a video from Andy Duncan for white metal soldering on our YouTube channel as well. So if you want to actually look at a detailed video of white yeah, Andy's metal, yeah, and he's got edited quite a, a, a detailed. Um, one on, on white metal soldering. I'm using phosphoric acid this time, and I'm just literally going to join these two pieces of white metal together without destroying them. Now, this is only a little tiny 15 watt soldering iron, a little, little tiny 15 watt Antex iron. So it is a very, very small iron. Uh, and here I have some white metal solder, 70 degree solder. So if we just put a little bit of um, phosphoric acid flux onto the white metal there. And I'll pick up some solder on the, on the tip of the iron. Let that cool off because it's being 70 degrees solder. It takes a little bit of time just to cool off. And that's how you solder white metal to white metal. I don't know if we if we could see that. It's as simple as that. A lot of people are frightened on soldering white metal because it does melt very very easily. But particularly if you're working in O gauge, um, generally the castings are, are quite big. There's nothing to sort of really be too too scared of. Um, if you're at a show, someone like Andy Duncan will probably let you have some scrap white metal to practice on. But it is very very easy to solder. It takes solder beautifully. Um, there's no problem with that at all. You you can add to it. Put a nice little fillet of solder in there and I'm not melting the white metal. I'm only using a very small iron, but you do just need to let the solder sort of cool off and sort of flash off there. We've got a very good joint there. Now on the on the white metal, you probably can't see that on the camera very easily, but they are securely joined. That's all that's all there is to it. That's soldering white metal to white metal. Okay. okay. I don't know if we can see that better on the I'll try if I can. We're not in focus. There we are. It's just two little bits of white metal joined together. Okay. 
Okay. Um, Derek's just said that he did check the Weller tips, which are copper and plated. So that will answer that query about the copper yep. tips that we started with. Um, and Dave Smith, show manager for Kettering, has said, don't forget that you can actually see Rob in person if you've got any further questions, because he will be demonstrating for us at Kettering. Yep. Um, if anybody wants to come along to Kettering, we can we can give them a little bit hands on if they like as well. So yeah. Yeah. Um, and Ian's kindly given us the web link there to Andy Duncan's white metal soldering video as well. Um, so thank you, Rob. Um, I'll come back to you in a moment. I just want to quickly share my screen and make sure people are aware of what we've got coming up in the uh, next well, week, in fact, well, for in terms of catering. Um, we'll start with the next evening with. So the next evening with is planned for Saturday, the 26th of March. So we're keeping them on the 26th of each month. That changes the, obviously, day of the week, although it happens that in March it will be a Saturday as well. Booking for March 2022 starts at midnight tonight um, and a reminder will be sent here at the time. And in the case of this session, which is Kevin Cartwright talking about O-Gage road vehicles, um, his video will be out nearer the time. Um, he's just finishing a build for us, which will go on to that video. Um, you'll see Kevin out and about as one of our area managers and constituency representatives, but he has a particular interest in not only building kits of road vehicles, but also adapting some of the off-the-shelf models that you can get. Um, and it certainly does bring a layout to life if you've got various um, vehicles about the place. And he, he even has a dad's army van, Jones's the butcher's van, um, with all the rifles coming out the roof, which he uses a sort of automata for. So very interesting session to look forward to in March. Please don't forget that we are going live at Kettering next week, so it will all be over this time next week, but um, I'm really hoping that a lot of you will be able to come along to Kettering. Um, the advanced tickets are on sale now, which gets you an early entry at 9.30. Everything you need to know about the show can be accessed from the front page of the website. There's a link to the show page. There's a link to the car parking information, a link to the show guide and a link to the advanced tickets. So everything you need to know about Kettering on the front page of the website. I'm conscious we've got some non-members with us. Um, I will tell you about the other shows later in the year so that you know that we've got another show coming up in June, on the 11th of June in Doncaster. And then our big two-day convention, Gildex, is in Stafford, a new venue at Bingley Hall on the showground on the 3rd and 4th of September. And those flyers are available if anybody wants to get some and share them amongst their clubs and things. So that's a lot of information for people who may not be familiar with the Guild, but we do have three big shows a year. And if you are a non-member and want to try out the Guild, we do run a free trial membership. So you can go and sign up for just a one month free trial to have a good look around the website, find out everything that we offer and try before you buy, as they say, see what you what you think of all of the resources. We're not just a Gazette and a Guild News. We have a huge amount of information on the website and a very good YouTube channel and lots of trader listings and an encyclopedia, the wiki, as we call it, of O-Gage modelling techniques. Um, and for anybody who doesn't know, if you just go onto the front page of the forum under about us there is a drop down box it says join online and you just literally go to that and at the bottom it says three one month trial um, and obviously for anybody who does want to join us we've got rolling membership now as well so whenever you join it doesn't matter what month it is you'll have 12 months and payments are just taken on the first day of the month. So if you joined on the 16th of 
February, you wouldn't pay until March the following year. It, you know, it becomes the 1st of March when the payments go out. Um, but that's a big um, bonus. So I just want to say thank you very much to all of you for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you again on March the 26th. And I'm just going to come off screen share so we can see Rob again and say thank you very, very much, Rob. Really well, interesting evening. There's thank you for thank you for pulling in. up with my with, with, with my ramblings, Jackie. And can I just say thank you to my grandson, Jamie, who's been sat here switching between cameras and lights and things and pulling up with me all evening. <laughs> There's some lovely comments coming in saying thank you very much and, yes. and what yeah. a big thank you and how excellent it's been and how informative. Um, and as I say, we're delighted that you'll be with us at Ketra and our other two shows this year if anybody wants to do some face-to-face -face work with okay. you as well. No problem. Okay, thank you All very right. much, everybody. See you uh, again thanks. very soon. If you're at Kettering, say hello. Um, and then we'll see you hopefully on the 26th of March. Thank you uh, all. Thank you, oh, Jackie. I, thank you, Rob. Uh, thanks that so was much. Really helpful. Uh, absolutely fantastic. Yes. Thank you. Bye, mate. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah.